North Georgia, it's time to talk. This is the Martha Zoller Show presented by Gainesville Mechanical and hosted by Talkers Magazine's 2023 Woman of the Year, Martha Zoller. On North Georgia's News Talk, AM 550 and FM 102.9, WDUN. Always here, always local. Stocks ending higher after retail sales declined in January, which helped boost hopes for interest rate cuts from the Fed later this year. Energy and financials were the biggest gainers, while tech companies lagged. And shares of Wells Fargo jumped over 7% after the bank announced that a key regulator said it had successfully fulfilled an eight-year-old legal requirement related to its fake account scandal. The Dow winners, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Chevron. The Dow decliners, Microsoft, Cisco, and Nike. The Dow rising 349 points. The Nasdaq up 47, S and P 500 up 29 for its 11th record close of the year. Hillary Barsky, Fox News. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and I had planned to do a Fonnie Willis cut there, but that's my mistake. Sean Dell Summer is here with me right now. It was the cut about the money, the money that she had in her house. Sean Dell Summer is here with me today after she did a fantastic job on News Nation uh, doing analysis with Geraldo Rivera and others related to the Fonnie Willis case and the Trump cases. Uh, Sean Dell, um, just give us kind of your thoughts in general about what we saw yesterday from Fonnie Willis. Well, I think um, she, first of all, took this very bold step by walking into the courtroom and just sort of acted like she owned the place. Um, She overruled her co-counsel, who was trying to argue that the subpoena that was issued for Fonnie Willis to testify should be quashed, which means um, dismissed. So she comes in in this very defiant mood, and she steps up on the witness stand And the judge had to kind of calm her down a few times because she was just so um, out of control, is how I would describe it. Uh, But she just gave the performance of a lifetime, I would say. It may have sunk her career, and it probably will result in the district attorney's office getting disqualified. But I think more importantly, uh, she perjured herself. Uh, She told the jury things that were incredible. Uh, And she kind of left a little bit of a paper trail in reflection on it this morning i'm thinking of all the things she said that could be double checked uh which might put her in a very poor light well and they didn't have a jury this is just a judge there's not a jury in there but but there's a jury pool watching that's for sure and i think what's interesting too is that um you know i've been in situations where i've had to testify and and i've also been in situations where i have advised people about crisis communications and the piece of evidence that i mean the piece of advice that i'm sure she's given to witnesses as well as i've given to witnesses and i've taken from my lawyer is you only answer the questions you're asked she was doing a soliloquy on every question and bringing in all kinds of new information that then the lawyers could ask her about Yes, she um, extrapolated on every subject, including very intimate details of her life, um, and she really threw Nathan Wade under the bus. I thought that was an interesting part of the um, testimony. She said that, um, you know, she sort of suggested that he had some medical problem, which she didn't want to talk about, um, which affected somehow their intimacy. Uh, (laughs) I thought that was so tacky Um, and then she also said that he told her once that uh, the only thing women can do for him is to make him a sandwich well my thoughts on that are if that's the person that's in your office making derogatory comments about women and this person is going to be out representing the DA's office um, don't you think that that is going to make every woman in the jury pool in Fulton County um, standoffish I would say that making him into this CAD, but yet keeping him on as an employee or a special prosecutor, um, he's not technically an employee of hers, but he's a special prosecutor that she hired, uh, suggests to me that he might have something to say if she were to terminate him and they left on bad terms. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, my friend Mara Davis uh, said, who's going to play Fonny in the movie? And I answered back to her, well, 
I think more likely there'll be an SNL sketch this yes. Saturday night uh, where they'll be doing that. You would mention that, and it's going to be funny. But also, let's mention Nathan Wade. First of all, he seemed a little uncomfortable. Secondly, I've never seen, I mean, I drink a lot of water, but I have never seen somebody drink so much water during a testimony. And that's usually a sign of kind of nervousness when you get dry mouth and you've got to drink a lot of water. A lot of times it means you're not telling the truth. <laughs> and I just think that they did not seem believable. I think they got together on their testimony somehow. She said they didn't have any conversations, but boy, their stories really matched up. Yes, and I have some swampland in Florida, as they say. Obviously, they got together on their timeline. Obviously, they got together on this concept of she paid him back in cash. Uh, the explanation that she reimbursed Nathan Wade in cash was just not credible. As one of the attorneys said, it didn't pass the smell test. And it's undermined by the fact that you have to file disclosure reports in Fulton County when you receive gifts or favors from, from someone who does business with the county. Since he's paid by the county, she's doing business with him. So in her 2022, uh, which is when some of those trips were taken, in her 2002 disclosure report, where it asked if you had received any gifts or favors or anything over the value of $100, she said no. Uh, so that sort of undermines her credibility that um, he didn't give her gifts um, and that this reimbursement idea from cash she just has sitting around the house. On the one hand, she's saying she had to move from her father's house into this apartment because she was so her father was so afraid for his safety or her safety. And then she's telling everybody that she keeps all this cash in her house well and then she sits back and she says it's kind of like reading men are from mars and women are from venus and she's saying when they were asking her when the relationship ended and she goes well you know men look at it differently right and women and and we stop being intimate at this time but uh that's when are, he thinks you know, it's over that's when he thinks it was <laughs> oh over goodness. but it really wasn't over until i had this talk with him right you know that. this difficult conversation i think is what she called it so i just thought she just overspoke. Now, I've heard a bunch of analysts. I've been listening to a bunch of analysts that have said, okay, she's had time to think about it now. They expect a different tone this morning. And lawyers have had all night to prepare based on all these extra things she threw out there that there's going to be a real interesting day today. What do you think? I think it's going to be an interesting day, but much more subdued. I, I think that the, the circus was yesterday, as they say. Um, today, I think we'll just be sort of um, perfecting the record, getting into some records. I mean, to me, I'm a divorce lawyer, so I do this kind of stuff all the time. Where are the phone records? Um, and the the visits to the condo that she rented, I think, are also very important because that is the time frame before, she, before he was hired. Um, Ms. Yurdy, who kind of gave the most damning testimony yesterday and said they were in a romantic relationship um, at the time that she rented this condo to Fonnie Willis. She said that um, uh, during that time that he visited her at least 10 times at the condo. Well, you know, come on. I don't have employees visiting me at my house 10 times. Um, and I, I think that sort of suggests they were in a relationship. Or if you did, it wouldn't be just one employee. You know, maybe you've got some kind of work from home office and there would be a history of lots of employees coming by your office. It right. Because be just one particular employee right. coming by your home. Right. Because yeah. this was a group effort. There's a lot of people working yeah. on this case. So you don't really just want to have one person singled out so you can talk to them uh, without telling the rest of the group what's going on. I think the phone records, again, um, if they have them, will be... Um, critical to proving the times of day he's calling her, um, you know, and and they may be, you know, very late into the night, long phone calls and that type of thing. And of course, they've got the easy explanation that they were just doing work that time of the night. But I think the frequency and the the timing of the phone calls will be important information to discover. 
It is the Martha Zoller Show. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we've got a couple of phone calls at 770-535-2911. And then we are going to continue talking about the Fonnie Willis-Nathan Wade case. And it looks, they started about 15 minutes ago with the new session. Uh, obviously, um, you know, the, the judge made it sound like he wanted to get started at 9 o'clock. We'll see if they did. And we'll keep talking with you on the Martha Zoller Show. I withdrew money throughout that time period, throughout my life. I've, I've withdrawn money from the bank, yes, of course. Talking about cash, from that is that you go to a cash, bank right. or you go to an ATM cash. and you take cash out. Either that way or you go to Publix and you overpay or you go to another store and you overpay. So, yes, both through that, yes. It is the Martha Zoller Show. I'm here with Shondell Summer. I'm sure Publix loved the shout out. You go to Publix. <laughs> And you just put that money in your pocket and go home and put it in your stash. Right. <laughs> and nobody uses cash apps anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's so nobody uses cash or they don't use cash, cash apps. apps. I mean, that's how oh, people okay. transfer money these days. Uh, yeah. It yeah. seems to me anytime I'm reimbursing someone for something, I generally do it by Venmo or Zelle. Yeah, and I still do cash. I mean, I, I get that kind of, think I don't have six months worth of cash. Please don't come to my door. But, I mean, I keep a little cash around, and you know, so that come the revolution, you know, I've still got sure. some money. But, it's, but you're not giving it to your boyfriend no, who's taking you on these trips, and he has plenty of money so he can afford it. <laughs> and I they're, mean, working, they're working on a case, and they're taking seven vacations. Correct. And somewhere along the way, she thought it was a good idea to describe for the court that that she paid for this wine tasting that had caviar and special wines and a champagne chaser i mean i'm just thinking how out of touch is this person and then she said but she's not much of a wine drinker she likes gray goose gray goose I know. it's really, okay if it if it wasn't so serious it would it would be funny. And, I think sociologists is- will be analyzing this testimony for years. Um, <laughs> and also legal persons will be analyzing this as a way not to do it or um, a way to fight back. I mean, depending on your perspective. But I will say this. Um, she provided way too much information about their relationship um, to where it's kind of almost um, impossible to think that she wasn't involved with him before this thing started. Um, I I just don't buy this whole explanation that yeah, yeah so I many words to guy. describe so many words to describe a close friendship. You know what I mean? It's it's very interesting to me. Um, so getting back to Fonnie Willis uh, and this Nathan Wade testimony, and then the friend, the thirty year friend uh, that you know basically um, kind of blew up everything and seemed pretty credible because she's got nothing to win or lose by testifying to this timeline Shondell I mean she's really not involved um was she fired or anything I know they worked together but she wasn't fired or anything like that was she she said she resigned it sounded like one of those resigned under pressure they had some falling out but she wasn't really clear on circumstances as to why she left what was interesting to me about her testimony yesterday is she wasn't there I mean, this is like a very important hearing, obviously covered from dawn to dusk by um, uh, different news agencies. And it looked a little uh, amateurish that they didn't have their witness there. I mean, if I had a hearing and the witness isn't there, the first thing I'm going to ask the judge to do is issue the defaulting witness rule and have the sheriff go pick her up. Right. And they sort of were like, oh, well, she's not here. And then there's this other attorney who zooms in and says he's got a conflict. He's got some case down in another county. And as though that that would take precedence over a hearing where he's representing somebody who's been subpoenaed as a witness. Do you think that would have never happened before COVID, would it, would it, Shondell? Well, because I think since COVID, people are allowing these kinds of exceptions. Uh, I, you know, every courtroom is different. And... It sounds as though this judge was okay with letting her zoom in. The problem with having a Zoom witness is you can't see who's in the room with them. You can't see who's feeding them information. And, you know, there was, even during her testimony, there was some woman who kept walking in front of the camera. So you saw sort of glimpses of her. But I thought it was just incredibly um, 
you know, kind of understated. Now, as it turned out, it, it worked out for him because before that they had called um, Nathan Wade's attorney as a witness. And I always kind of wondered how that was going to go. You know, you have an attorney client privilege. So obviously anything he told him about some affair or relationship he was having would have affected his divorce. So that kind of got shut down pretty quickly. Um, but a lot of the reason they called the attorney was because this woman, Miss Yurdy, didn't show up. And that, to me, was just shocking, um, the way this thing started off. But they recovered when they got her to testify, and she, of course, gave sort of the information which um, impeaches Fonnie Willis's testimony and Nathan Wade's testimony. So let's go back to the phones and talk to Tom in Westfield. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Uh, awesome. I'm sitting on the second floor in Westfield looking at the post office from my second floor Eagles Nest. I love it. And uh, Shondell and Martha, this this is absolutely awesome. This is the ultimate appetizer, entree, and dessert. And hearing you guys talk about it, it reminds me of entitlement entanglement. And the, her attitude come marching in like it's her place. She throws her best friend under the bus and says uh, she's betraying her, which basically corroborates and almost adds and gives her credibility. Then as Shandell said, she's blurting out spontaneous utterances which are self-implicating and now it's admissible. She brought it up. Now it's evidence to be explored. And of course, I heard about the pants she's wearing in spandex and the way the judge was almost not being aggressive, not calling for the, uh, the, the immediate witness to appear. And this is probably the best part. When she hired him, and she, first of all, everyone does this it shouldn't be a big deal when she hired him. It, well, it is, it is if there's impropriety, but as far as people working together and feelings for each other, that's normal. It's how you handle it and how you maintain professionalism. That's key. So when uh, she was hired, him in 2019, 600000 is a ton of money. They hadn't gone after Trump. And at that time, they were cuddling and kissing for over a year. Everyone noticed that. Yet nobody said anything on all those other cases she was prosecuting. In Massachusetts, Shundell, Mass General Law, Rule 14 says automatic, mandatory, any evidence that could, um, you know, create compromising or uh, uh, undermining of the evidence. Or Rule 30, Chapter 40, Subsection 2074, newly discovered evidence which it could affect, bring to the judge immediately. But they don't. It's their group. And in this entitlement entanglement, everything we're witnessing. It is a perfect anatomy and and a a profile of what a good system should be and how it could be. And sometimes it goes astray. And and thanks for your call today, Tom. Shondell and I are going to continue talking about this in the next segment. And someone that was in the courtroom about that dress. We're going to talk about that when we come back on the Martha Zoller Show. Let's be clear because you lied in this. this, Let me tell you which one you lied in right here. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth. And this it, is it, it is a lie. It is a lie. It is the Martha Zoller Show. And so, Shondell Summers here with me today. And I have a friend of mine, uh, Tamar uh, Hellerman, that uh, works for the AJC. And she was actually in the courtroom, okay? And she said it was just like, it was like watching an episode of Real Housewives, okay? Because she comes in, they don't expect her. In fact, her lawyer was up kind of saying she wasn't going to testify. I mean, he hadn't gotten the whole sentence out yet. But right. she walks in and you know she's got this dress which i thought looked really bad on tv until she sat down but tamar said that it really looked great in the court she said it really made a that's why it looked like real housewives so it was very interesting and then she goes right into this you're a liar you lied about me i'm glad you got taken apart that just doesn't seem like witness behavior that seems it, like prosecutor behavior i mean it was inappropriate courtroom to decorum i will tell you that much um for her to come in and sort of interrupt the proceedings and then to you know kind of sit on the witness stand and get me these documents and so um the judge is like okay does anybody have copies of the exhibits which is you know fine but usually your lawyer says look at this exhibit but (laughs) anyway so she demands these exhibits she gets them she starts calling ashley merchant a liar 
which among lawyers, the liar word is really uncool. I don't know that it's inappropriate, but it is not cool to call the other attorney a liar because we're all trying to do a job here. And to make personal attacks on the other lawyer is not considered professional. So she starts doing all of that. That liar quote just blows me away every time I hear it. Um, And then the judge says, "Okay, well, we'll take five minutes for somebody to make copies of these exhibits she's demanding. And she says, I'll wait. And he says, you can, you know, go down and get off the witness stand till we come back in session. So I thought the judge in the case, McAtee, did a great job yesterday. I mean, I've tried cases in front of hundreds of judges over my career, and he is just the most calm, nonplussed, makes intellectual decisions, and um, really just kind of rolls with the punches. I think he lets people try their case, and I just... I can't say enough about him. He's been great, considering so how young news, he is. So breaking news is Fonnie Willis will not take the stand today as expected. Why is so that? So they first sent out a message saying Fonnie Willis will take the span- stand, uh, is expected to take the span- stand to defend herself, and that was 34 minutes ago just now. They said Fonnie Willis will not take the stand today as expected. Yes, and in fact, I have it sitting in front of me, my cell phone, with the live proceedings. And I was wondering, you had said they started at 9, and there's nobody in the courtroom. So I was wondering if they were having some... So there was some negotiations going on. And here's the thing that I think is interesting, is this case that looks like it's going to be the only one that's actually going to get to trial before the election, which is the the appeal on the um, hush money is the one that has the least impact, I think. What do you think? I think that they were really, really planning this. So, (laughs) I mean, conspiracy theories being what they are, I think they want that to be the first case that goes out. Because, for one thing, it blocks that federal case, which is getting perilously close to an end point with the Supreme Court petition um, for cert on the Court of Appeals ruling regarding absolute immunity so they needed to block that case more than anything because if anything's going to influence the election it's going to be that case or even even the georgia case but that case about the hush money i mean really it's kind of a who cares and it also is just some business uh, omission to put it in the business records i don't think anyone's going to get up in arms about it they're just going to see this as further prosecution of donald trump and So I'm sure they're just pleased as punch that this is the first case going out because they could drag that thing out probably till the summer. Yeah, and I think it's, um, you know, in Russia today, the news is is that one of Vladimir Putin's political opponents died suddenly, one that was in prison, that was was supposed to be in prison for a long period of time and died suddenly. Um, You know, big surprise. That's what happens to the people that oppose uh, Vladimir Putin. But, you know, uh, while we have had cycles in our history where it has felt this corrupt never under the light of social media and the kind of connection that we have today the kind of communication that we have today certainly the early 1900s was nothing but one corrupt scandal after another related to not only elected officials some of them people are well known the tammany hall scandal that happened in new york state and new jersey there are other ones around the country but because they were more localized even the scandals that happened in washington dc were not the kinds of things that the whole world heard about i would i would be willing to to say that watergate was probably the first nationwide known huge scandal that happened related to the government where where people were glued to their tvs watching it and all of that sort of thing uh prior to that they were pretty localized and and that you might know about them if you were involved in them but you didn't have you know entire countries glued to a television set watching stuff up until the past you know 60 or 70 years so you know i always have faith that we're going to get better and that we're going to get out of this and things are going to get better but i do think it's a huge mistake the crossover to where you are prosecuting your political opponents as opposed to beating them at the ballot box. Absolutely. I mean, we don't want to be in a position where everybody is afraid to run for office because they think they're going to come out of it with um, some type of criminal charge. And, you know, I I always thought the whole put her in jail thing, uh, put her in jail chant. Lock her up. Lock, lock her, her up. up. Thank yep. you. 
um, that Donald Trump started really was the genesis of this whole di- idea that we put our political opponents in And ironically, in when jail. it came down to it, he didn't do that. He's the one that, that his administration and he made the decision he wasn't going to pursue it. And that's well documented. And because he didn't want to cross that Rubicon. I mean, he, he's a big talker. But when it came right down to it, he did not prosecute her. Yeah, I'm always kind of trying to analyze his personality. Um, and I'm sure this is just pop You're psychology. not the only one. <laughs> but um, it does seem as though, you know, he goes for the jugular. We 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 get that. And so he sort of brought that into American politics, I think, before there was a, more of a civility to it. And there were just certain areas you didn't touch. He didn't do that. You know, he just went for the jugular. And then, but when it comes down to it, when he can use the Justice Department to go after his enemies, um, he doesn't do it. Right. Or at least he didn't during his administration. Well, he has, he has this respect for kind of um, high office sort of things. Like, for example, when he went to the UK and visited the Queen. Oh, my God, that was a Donald Trump nobody had ever seen. He was very deferential. He was he was very respectful. He didn't do any, he didn't crack any inappropriate jokes or any of that kind of stuff. Um, he was very appropriate. He behaved very appropriately, very presidentially, if you will. Um, he does have these certain areas where he is is very differential and then there's you know the guy that gets out in front of the crowd and will just say anything you know we'll call nikki haley bird brain and he's probably not going to debate nikki haley and we are probably if it ends up being biden um trump which i think it's less likely that biden is going to be the nominee um just because of all the things that have happened uh, you know i think it's very likely that because of the precedent that's been set we will have no debates from now until november and i think that's a disservice yes i think you're probably right i don't think that um they want joe biden on a stage so let me ask you this question since i wasn't here last friday and i want to you know we got about two minutes to do this answer before we need to take break um what do you think about that press conference last thursday night for um uh, biden coming out after and, the report of the yes. special counsel yes um you know, I was, I think I said on the radio the next morning, it reminded me of those commercials where they say, does your elderly loved one have um, agitation Alzheimer's? Where <laughs> That's kind of what it reminded me of. I mean, it, he played to type and he, he came out and he was angry and um, offended, whereas he could have come out like he did the week before and said, hey, by the way, I'm 40, you know, I just look a little older, uh, something kind of clever. And the maybe way Reagan diffused. was. The way Reagan was about his age. Right. He made jokes about it. Right. And diffused the issue. But instead, I think he sort of reinforced that um, he's a little out of touch. Uh, but, you know, the truth is, I, I guess lately I'm like, the economy is great. The stock market's up. Um, inflation seems to be coming down. Hopefully mortgage rates are coming down. So think the wheels are on the bus, and maybe it doesn't take a president to run the country. Maybe <laughs> it just takes the I country thought, to run itself. I thought it seemed, well, people should get out of the way. I mean, the economy does the best when people get out of the way. But it did look to me a little bit like Grandpa had a wreck. Everybody knows Grandpa had a wreck, but he's telling you, no, he didn't hit the wall. <laughs> it was somebody else's fault, right? <laughs> it was somebody else's <laughs> fault. I mean, I had that situation happen with my mother, God rest her soul. There was a dent in our garage door that perfectly lined up with this this sedan that my mother drove at that time. And and she was like, oh, no, I didn't do that. And I said, Mom, the, the front of the car fits right in this dent. <laughs> you know? yeah, I love you, baby, but you're not driving anymore. Yeah. Well, we took the keys away after that because she couldn't remember that she had done that. And that's where he is. Somebody needs to take the keys away. We'll take a break. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank our witnesses for being here. Um, I, I just came in a, a minute ago, Mr. O'Brien, but um, you said that the president has the authority to shut down the border right now. Under what authority uh, do you refer to? As I said, Section 1182F of the Immigration and Nationality Act, which was the statutory provision that was at issue in Trump v. Hawaii. It's a provision that allows the president by proclamation to temporarily suspend the admission of certain classes of aliens into the United States. So why didn't Donald Trump use that? 
He, he did. That's why the Trump v. Hawaii case went all the way to the Supreme Court. But then what? Ha- why was it relied on Title 42? Um, well, there was a pandemic on. I mean, Title 42 is pitched at a very different set of circumstances. It's specifically at a public health crisis. 1182F is pitched at a general power to manage the border in confrontation of a crisis. It is the Martha Zoller Show. That's Dan Goldman that's uh, uh, talking to some immigration judges in a hearing and, you know, really kind of making the case that there's already the laws on the books that if they could be followed. But interestingly enough, on immigration this month, uh, the Mexican government has stepped up and has started apprehending people and sending them 1,500 miles back to the southern part of Mexico and not allowing them to cross the U.S. border. And so border crossings were better this past month and they have been in a very long time. Uh, Stephen Cleveland said, Martha, after watching yesterday's proceedings, I would liken the drama more to Jerry Springer than the housewives. I think the nation now is looking at Georgia and asking themselves, what the heck is going on? Is this the best that Fulton County has to offer? That's Stephen Cleveland. And you know, Shondell, I agree. It is kind of that way. <laughs> I mean, I was watching it, you know, I practice law and thinking, this is such a, you know, amateur hour honestly in the beginning and i don't necessarily fault the judge for that i don't fault the district attorney's office i kind of fault the defense um i thought that for such a uh, a hearing of such gravamen they could have had those witnesses there or at least they could have determined whether or not there was going to be an attorney client privilege that was invoked the one thing fani willis said that's correct is that the affidavit that ashley merchant submitted in order to get the hearing uh sort of extrapolated and embellished the nature of the evidence she was planning to present um she suggested that um nathan wade's attorney was going to come in and talk about the affair that from the time period when they were friends before he was nathan wade's divorce attorney so that was not accurate and then she said that Fonnie Willis had lived with this woman, Ms. Yurdy, and, and kind of suggested that Ms. Yurdy had a basis in knowledge of the r- romantic relationship because of having lived with Fonnie Willis. And then, of course, that was not the way the evidence panned out. It indicated that Fonnie Willis actually leased Ms. Yurdy's condo. So, uh, to a certain extent, there was there were little things like that that I kind of thought um, the defense probably didn't have all their information before a hearing and that's not unusual people yeah i was gonna know, say that it's, it's you, not unusual you think it's gonna go in a certain way and you try to couch it in a certain way so you can get the other side to admit to stuff right correct and and the yes. other thing is it appeared from the questioning of the attorney for nathan wade that he had had some text messages um that he had uh that she had that Ashley Merchant had where he was texting her saying something about the relationship. So we'll wait and see what develops there. And I guess you've got, you know, whether it's Hall County DA office, Fulton County DA office, you've got people that are working together. It's generally long hours. And I don't even care about the relationship part of it. It's that you you probably do end up socializing with these people. You probably do end up having conversations where sometimes they're privileged and sometimes you're just being their friend. And it probably gets really complicated. Am I wrong about that? Well, you know, having come from a background of having met my husband and when we were co-workers (laughs) at the district attorney's office and Hall County, we were we were laterals, right? I mean, we both worked there in the same capacity. It wasn't like I was dating someone who paid me, right. um, and that's the difference I see here. She had direct control over payments to him, and then he was using those payments to take her on these trips around the world. You know, he's a world traveler, and um, so I think that is the the conflict of interest that comes in. And that's where she profited from the prosecution because the more he goes on with the prosecution, the more they prosecute, the more he gets paid. So, and also, so they kept talking about, but the relationship wasn't disclosed. So is there, and I don't know what the rules are in Fulton County, but you know, that obviously people that work together sometimes end up dating, uh, but you just have to disclose that. Is that what they were implying? That the problem was they didn't disclose their relationship and there was this 
this money involved i don't think you have to disclose a relationship even under these circumstances i don't think that has anything to do with it okay i think the fact that they're suggesting that she hired him because of the fact that he was her boyfriend is the problem so in other words that's why the timeline's important yes you know if she hired him not because he was qualified but because he's her boyfriend and he wanted to make a lot of money on this and then he's using that money to take her around the world well that's a different story my problem is that he was making three times the money the other prosecutors were that had more experience in this area and um, it was money that was supposed to be used to be clearing actual criminal cr- trials uh, that affected real people in Fulton County. And I think that's what it comes right down to. It. The average person looking in says, yes, what the pre- former president did, the phone call was bad, all of that kind of stuff. But um, really, was anybody harmed in Fulton County other than maybe the two poll workers that were named and they're getting a big settlement? So uh, is this really a case that she should be spending these kinds of resources on? And she said she could walk and chew gum at the same time, but seven vacations? My gosh. (laughs) You know, I mean, obviously she can walk and chew gum at the same time. (laughs) Here's another thing, and this was in the motion filed by Ashley Merchant. She profited... Well, not profited, but she cooperated in um, a book that was written about the um, the Brad Raffensburg asking for the votes uh, by Michael Ishikoff. And he wrote this book, and she is highly featured in the book. And she's talking about how she's been threatened and how she's doing the Lord's work, prosecuting Trump and all of that. She has tainted the jury pool in Fulton County because now she's made herself a target of all of these racial epithets and all these threats. So, of course, you're in Fulton County. Of course, that's going to affect the jury pool.